Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's a little bit before five, so we'll give us some time for folks to join us in the uh, Zoom world and also on Facebook where we're streaming this. Um, had a number of folks who were uh, showing a lot of interest in participating. Hey, Sam, good to see you pop up on the screen. I guess you're uh, back from your vacation. Good to see you. Um, so yeah, um, as we let some more people in, I'd like to welcome everyone. If you have any comments or questions, uh, you can put those in the Zoom chat or in Facebook, um, or you can email us directly at programs at albemarlehistory.org. We'll be addressing uh, some Q&A at the end of uh, uh, Lynn's talk tonight. So uh, if any questions pop into your mind as uh, she's doing her presentation, just feel free to add it into the chat. And uh, we might even jump right in and incorporate it into the talk or uh, we'll hold it to the end. So I'll give it a little time here. We hit the five o'clock mark. Um, So a few announcements before we get started, give uh, people a little bit more opportunity, opportunity to join us. Um, on January 17th, we will be uh, kickstarting our 2022 programs with our annual um, membership meeting. And we're gonna have our special guest and a new member of the ACHS board, uh, Gail Jessup White, uh, discussing her book, Reclamation, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson, and a Descendant's Search for Her Family's Lasting Legacy. So um, hold the date for that, January 17th. On February 9th, uh, we will be making a uh, return to uh, Northside Library in JMRL uh, for Penn Park Part 2. Uh, it'll be a follow-up panel discussion about the ongoing work to identify the un unmarked burials of the enslaved community that were found outside of the walls of the family cemeteries at Penn Park. So hold the date for February 9th on that one. In late February, we haven't narrowed down the date yet, but we will have a program with David McCormick, um, who's the new executive director of Early Music America. Uh, he will be discussing his research into the black fiddlers of Monticello, um, among other things, among other projects that he's involved in. So. We'll be posting information about that as we uh, are able to narrow down the dates and times. In March, um, another one that we haven't yet determined a date, but we do want to do a great program on this one because we need to share with you all the work that we have been doing to save Hatton Ferry again. Um, seems like that's a common refrain about every decade when, uh, you know, man's ability to try to put an iron barge on a river and control nature, um, you know, we just have to put the time and effort into preserving and uh, keeping that uh, historic landmark functioning. So we have plans to have it running for a full season next year. So uh, come stay tuned in March for a program on that. Uh, between April 15th and May 15th, um, we will have on display here at the Historical Society, the Hampton History Museum's traveling exhibit, When Computers Wore Skirts, NASA's Human Computers. So uh, come by the uh, Historical Society at 200 Second Street Northeast to see it. And we're also planning on maybe taking that show on the road and having it at a couple different places throughout uh, Albemarle and Charlottesville. And there's so much more to come in 22. Uh, so stay tuned. And as we close out 2021 and what a year it's been, we look forward to next year and we have successes to be proud of. We have some challenges to overcome and we have new goals to pursue. Uh, so if you have not seen or responded to our end of year appeal letter, um, I will drop a link in the chat and in the comments section in Zoom and Facebook. You can read the letter to discover all the things we are grateful for in 2021 and why we are optimistic for 2022. So for those who have supported our work financially this year, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, if you've not already contributed, please consider a donation to help us close 2021 on a high note and uh, position us to do even more in 2022. So um, enough with the announcements and our end of year appeal. Um, 
So as I put it out there in our uh, promotional material, so on the 17th day of December, I'm not going to sing for you, but uh, we're very happy to uh, have this program with Lynn Rainville uh, with us this evening. I was trying to think back um, earlier this week about when I uh, actually met Lynn, and I think if my memory serves correctly, it was directing uh, the archaeological work with Matt Reeves at James Madison's Montpelier many years ago, probably sometime between 2003 and 2006. Um, but I do know for certain, starting in 2006, I was involved in the amazing work being done by a group that is now known as the Central Virginia History Researchers, um, with members such as Cinder Stanton and Bob Vernon, Lenny Sorensen, Sam Towler, um, Alice Cannon, Shelley Murphy, and many others. And uh, I think Lynn was one of those founding members of that group too. So as a group, um, um, it's a perfect example of how the study and understanding of local history is so important. So with that, please let me introduce Sterling Howe to the Zoom podium. And uh, he's our programs and volunteer coordinator, and he will introduce Lynn and, and welcome her to uh, our Zoom program. So take it away, Sterling. Thank you, Tom. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, as Tom said, I'm Sterling Howell, and we would very much like uh, to welcome you to our Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society speaker series. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn Rainville, who will be addressing the literal and metaphorical excavations at Sweetbriar College that revealed how African-American labor transformed the Sweetbriar Plantation into a private women's college in 1906. Lynn Rainville is an author, speaker, and public historian who studies ordinary Virginians doing extraordinary things in the past. Since earning her PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology, she has spent two decades studying historic cemeteries, gravestones, enslaved communities and their descendants, um, town poor farms, and Virginia's role in World War I. This research is supported by multiple grants and published in dozens of articles and five books. And her talks, books, articles, and exhibits have been featured in dozens of national newspapers, local publications, and television and radio shows. In 2019, she arrived in Lexington as the inaugural director of institutional history and the museums at Washington Lee University, where she, she is also a professor of anthropology. Thank you, Dr. Rainville, for joining us today. And now the floor is all yours. Thank you both so much. And thank you for inviting me tonight. Before I moved to Lexington, I had lived in Charlottesville for 18 years. So I am delighted to see many friends and colleagues on this call um, and several individuals who know uh, more than I do about these various families, um, including descendants. So. What I will try to do in the next 45 minutes is really give an overview of what happens when we are missing a bunch of stories from American history. Um, and hopefully, of course, convince you after 45 minutes that even in just this one instance on one in one community within Central Virginia, that the families, the African American and Native American families that lived and worked there we have to understand their stories to have a complete picture of, in this case, the story of uh, what becomes Sweetbriar College. So I'm going to multitask for one moment as I go to my slides. Sterling, that's working? Yes, it is. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, the title of my book is Invisible Founders, How uh, several centuries of African-American families transformed a plantation into a college. I can say that I'm not gonna go in only in chronological order tonight because I, really I, um, I wanna emphasize some of the techniques and methods that any of you can do, whether you're studying different institutional histories or family histories, um, uh, all of these stories are critically important. Okay, there we are. So I wanted to start with this image. This is the plantation house at what was originally called Locust Ridge and then became Sweet, the Sweetbriar Plantation. This is all in the 19th century. 
roughly 100 years before the founding of Sweetbriar College in the early 20th century, uh, those two institutions, those plantations. This postcard here that was hand colored um, is trying to promote Sweetbriar as an early 20th century college. And if you would look at the back of this, and then there are many other postcards from this era promoting this newly founded women's college in Virginia, the goal of these postcards is to, of course, entice students to enroll, their parents to be comfortable sending their children there. And it's very much about kind of the, the, the ideology of gentility and we're gonna care for your, your white daughters because at that point it was, they did not accept uh, African-American students. But if you look carefully here, so you have this, this it's actually a somewhat unique architectural design. It's an, it, um, if you look at the center of this postcard, it, it's a traditional Virginian farmhouse from the late 18th century that has been transformed itself in the 1850s into an Italianate style. So extra fancy. Um, and now this is being used when, after the college is founded as the president's house. So a lot of symbolic value in this postcard, including the manicure, manicured lawns, which include uh, boxwood hedges that are another symbol associated with these elite mansions and plantations. And then if you look carefully on the right-hand side, there's uh, a wheelbarrow. And on the left-hand side is the gardener. Small details, but um, they're hidden in plain sight. And I would suggest that, um, although it does appear as if the photographer on that day caught the individual working as the gardener a little bit by surprise, the, the photographer in the end had a choice on which uh, version of this picture to use for these promotional purchases. And my suggestion would be that they included the gardener because they wanted to promote the fact that these white women were going to be taken care of by other individuals. And then part of my work is to ensure that we know these individuals by name, we know their contributions, and that instead of being in the background of images, they come to the forefront. And I'll return at the very end of the talk. I, I do, after many, many, many years of work, although this individual in the postcard is never identified by name in the historic documentation, I'm pretty certain I, I, we do know who this person is. So this fundamental question of who is a founder? I mean, if, if they're invisible founders, who are the founders who are better known and why? So in the case of Sweetbar, again, a, a 20th century college, but originally founded as a plantation, the individual here on the left, Elijah Fletcher, a Vermonter by birth, he was the founder of the Sweetbar plantation. And his story uh, and his, the arc of his, uh, life is kind of a microcosm of American history and the failure to end the institution of slavery without a bloody war. So as I mentioned, he was born in Vermont. Vermont was actually the first um, uh, recently freed colony to abolish slavery in 1777. So, and his parents were abolitionists. So, um, when Elijah Fletcher, he's one of many children in Vermont, they're a poor family. He goes, he leaves Vermont to search for um, better employment opportunities. Through a circuitous series of circumstances, he ends up in Virginia, in Amherst County. He starts as a school, a tutor, very poor, but he's tutoring um, the children of wealthy Amherst families. And that's where he meets the woman that he marries, who's Marie Antoinette Crawford. She's from a wealthy Amherst family. The photograph, uh, uh, the watercolor um, in the center is a depiction of this home uh, called Tusculum. And in 1813, when Elijah marries uh, Marie Antoinette, one of their wedding presents is an African-American boy and a girl who are in the process of being given away, are being separated from their families and are bringing Elijah into this horrible institution of slavery as a slave owner. Um, Elijah Fletcher, despite the way he was brought up, um, ends up himself uh, um, owning uh, 
first helping his father-in-law settle the estate at Tusculum, then purchasing slaves on his own behalf, and then later uh, buying the land that becomes Sweetbriar College um, and Sweetbriar Plantation. And by the eve of the Civil War, Elijah Fletcher has enslaved over 150 individuals who are living at the Sweetbriar Plantation. So I mentioned at the beginning, these stories of African-American and native families really need to be part of when we tell American stories, even the short versions, their contribution should be part of it. And, and so one of the things that motivated me to do this research is I arrived at Sweetbriar two decades ago and Sweetbriar has its own very robust, the, the college now has its own robust history. It's uh, founded over a century ago as um, an elite women's college. And the story, when I arrived 20 years ago, the standard story for the founding of the college revolved around the white founders. And um, I've just mentioned Elijah Fletcher. He had died in 1858, so he did not live to see the founding of Sweetbriar College. But when he died, he distributed his land holdings, the people that he held in bondage, he distributed all of that wealth among three of his children. And one of them is the woman here. Um, and, uh, she founds when, uh, she marries right after the civil war, she and her husband have a daughter, their daughter dies young, very tragically. And it's through her daughter's death that she wants to do something to remember her daughter. And she, in her will, when she dies in 1900, agrees to found or decides to found Sweetbriar College. So the important part of this story that's missing is these two women are contemporaries. The, the photographs depict them at different parts in their lives, um, but um, they were born at the exact same time. Um, but the woman on the right was an, was an enslaved woman named Martha Penn Taylor, and she served as a nursemaid for uh, Elijah Fletcher's children. Um, and we'll return to her story uh, because she ends up playing a very important role um, in the postbellum history of uh, the Sweetbriar Plantation. But that was one of those stories around a white founder, the daughter of a plantation owner, um, and then her daughter, Daisy Williams, who was born just after the end of the Civil War in 1867. Um, Daisy, unfortunately, had inherited a genetic condition, uh, unbeknownst to them, had inherited a deadly genetic condition from her father. So Daisy died in her teenage years unexpectedly. But the woman on the right, Signora Hollins, um, was, uh, they were both born around the same time and uh, were playmates in the 1860s in Reconstruction, Virginia. And again, we don't have a photograph of Signora as a young woman. Um, so you, you have to, uh, and Daisy died young, so we don't have an image of Daisy as an adult. Um, and Signora Hollins, having grown up on this immediate postbellum uh, plantation, um, born uh, from enslaved, uh, an enslaved family, Signora grows up, actually leaves Virginia for a while to work, but then comes back to work at what becomes Sweetbriar College for decades. So in the end of this story, by the end of the 20th century, all of Elijah Fletcher's, that are the original Sweetbriar founder, all of his immediate children have died. Um, most of their, either they didn't have grandchildren or their grandchildren are dead like Daisy. And so the irony of this in terms of the actual storyline and the contributions of various individuals, it's some of the African-Americans such as Signora um, who live into the 20th century, who actually see the full trajectory and work on the full trajectory from a plantation to a college. But all of these other stories about Signora, about Martha Penn Taylor had been overlooked in the retelling of this history. So in this fast forwarded 19th century version of a plantation that is transformed into a college based on the will of um, Indiana Fletcher Williams, Daisy's mother, uh, the work that 
that transformed the landscape was done predominantly by African American and Native Americans, um, including this horse draw drawn um, uh, roller for creating some of the roads. So as I mentioned, the colleges then, so Indiana herself um, has died in 1900. It was her will that it was the, the uh, it was through her will and a bequest that the college was founded. Um, on the far right is uh, Mary Kay Benedict, uh, our first, the first president, um, standing on the, an early photo of her standing at Sweetbriar College. But in this transition from what was first an antebellum plantation to a postbellum plantation to a college, the continuity was the, the African-American families that had been working there all along. So for example, Sweetbriar, even to this day, has a renowned award-winning uh, equestrian program. This is an early 20th century photograph of obviously one of the riders, one of the students, but if you look carefully, you'll notice there are, of course, grooms that are caring for the horses. Um, and in fact, throughout, whoops, that's funny. Why did that happen? There we are. Um, throughout these first couple decades, many of the grooms were African-American men from Amherst um, uh, helping to create this uh, program. Similarly, the campus, regularly wins awards because it is in this beautiful bucolic setting, um, over 3,000 acres that was part of originally a 10,000, the 10,000 acre plantation that Elijah had pulled together. This also requires a tremendous amount of labor. Um, and over the years, many of the grounds folks and the horticulturalists have been descendants of the enslaved community. One of the things I realized in my research, when I started 20 years ago, I actually started by studying, there are two at least two cemeteries on the campus of Sweetbriar. One uh, contains the graves of the Fletcher, the white Fletcher family, including Indiana's grave and her daughter Daisy and her husband's grave and Elijah Fletcher's grave. But there's also a graveyard for the enslaved families. That's how I started this research, um, through studying gravestones and mortuary traditions. But I was immediately struck by some of the, the families and their contributions and wanted to learn more about their stories. And after many years of work, starting with those 150 individuals who were enslaved as of 1860 and trying to figure out what happened to those individuals after emancipation, um, when I started tracking families into the present, I realized that roughly 20% of the hourly staff at Sweetbriar as of 15 years ago was directly descended from the enslaved community. And some of those individuals are shown in these uh, photos from the 1950s. And for example, this photograph on the right of the men sitting together, um, these are men, many of these men are descended from individuals who were enslaved at Sweetbriar. And they themselves worked at Sweetbriar College in some cases for 50 years. So if you add up the years of contributions, it's hundreds and hundreds of years of labor and contributions. Um, the image on the left hand side, um, the individuals holding the like the apple uh, basket, um, that's Sterling Jones and his wife Aurelia and I'll return to their story um, in a moment. So then the question is, well, what techniques can you use to reconstruct these stories, to learn more about these families? Um, when in documents, as in photographs, often the focus of the storytelling, because it's usually being done by a white audience for a white audience, you know, for example, the women in the foreground, and then what I really wanted to know was the names and the identities of the individuals in the background. And here, if you look carefully, you can see that pretty much the entire, the cooks, um, the servers, the people organizing this, all the individuals standing behind both the table on the left and then the table on the back, these are all African-American men and women. So who are these founders and how can we um, uh, tell their stories, recover their stories, tell their stories, and then uh, locate descendants in order, because in, in almost all cases, families themselves um, 
have important stories and insights that no amount of historic research will ever, you'll always need to hear directly from the families, not just from the archives. Um, and here, um, all of these, well, all these photographs, except for the young man who's a porter in the railroad, um, these are all taken from a 1930s publication, a, a Sweetbriar publication, where a student photographer went around and really in the space of just most likely a week or two, took photographs of some of the various individuals working to support the college, um, including obviously on the right-hand side, uh, Sig uh, Signora Hollins, who lived until uh, the 1950s. So one uh, primary source for tracking enslaved families is the wills of the white owners. In this case, this is an excerpt of the will of Elijah Fletcher. I mentioned that's the Vermonter. He died in 1858, just before the Civil War. This is the excerpt of his will where he is listing families that he had enslaved by name. And the reason why I've highlighted them on the right-hand side, by the way, is the original document, but I've highlighted them in different colors on the left because that's where um, these individuals are listed by families. And you can see when you start reading, for example, in purple, you can read that it's Tom and Hannah and their children, Martha, Anid, Marshall, Rachel, Mourning, and Asham. Um, so, and, and all of this is verbatim. This isn't me adding in the term, their children. Um, so fortunately, this was a very rich, from a kinship perspective, instead of just listing people by name without any kinship references, this gave a good start um, for doing the research. And I was very, very fortunate um, to be joined in this initial research by several um, Albemarle County historians, um, many of whom are on, the, I can't see the whole list of people right now, but I think many of them are on this call, um, uh, including people like Bob Vernon or Sam Towler or Cinder uh, Stanton, um, doing you know this very detailed work to take these names and these and the occasional surname and reconstruct who these individuals were. I wanted to give just one example again from the will. This is now a close up of the will itself. <clears throat> and you can start by seeing this name Calvin, who seems to be associated with Paulus and because it says Paulus, Silas, and Calvin. Although from this, it, it originally was not clear if it was just Silas and Calvin and, and which of the other names were associated. But after a lot of research, um, uh, including looking in the 1870 census, Cal, it is Paulus, Silas, and Calvin because these are all siblings. Um, and so then the dates that are listed here, this is not, does not come directly from any one document. This is now the research you go through, through the census, through death certificates, marriage certificates, gravestones, I mean, diaries, letters, et cetera. Um, so you have three brothers in this case. Then it turns out, um, although it wasn't necessarily connected, Betsy is, this is their mother. And that gives us even more, another layer of information um, to find, even though he's not listed here, to figure out who their father is, who's John Rose. All of this is the way to start building um, family trees for these individuals. Calvin Rose is actually one of the only individuals who was enslaved at Sweet Bar that we have an extant photograph for. Um, and the man on the right, the name Calvin, for a variety of reasons, he is almost certainly named after Elijah Fletcher's uh, brother, who is depicted here, who is Calvin Fletcher, who had actually moved further west, um, did not settle in Virginia, um, but who would have visited Sweetbriar occasionally. And in part, I show this because the lives of enslaved African Americans and their white owners are entwined, not just through the horrors of slavery itself, but through um, the forces of white, the death of white owners and who they, um, how they divide up black families. So it's always important to, to understand that context um, because of its impact on the lives of black and native families. So um, the Rose family um, has many, many connections to uh, Sweetbriar and Amherst County. And um, this is uh, Barbara Rose Page. Um, Barbara is descended from Givens Rose, who was another individual enslaved at Sweetbriar. And 
um, Barbara graduated from Sweetbriar. Sweetbriar uh, integrated in the mid 20th century, um, in the 1960s. It was a slightly unusual case because when Indiana Fletcher Williams made her will, she, she, she specified that her money would go to found a college for women, which is one of the many reasons why it's a women's college. But she also specified that it should be for only white women. So when Sweetbriar integrated, they had to take an additional step of going through the Supreme Court because they had to break the will to take out that racist language. Um, so uh, Barbara, um, actually Barbara's daughter had graduated from Sweetbriar before her in 1983, but then Barbara graduated um, as an adult learner um, in 1987 from Sweetbriar. So multiple, again, generations of connection. And on the left-hand side, this is Barbara's great uncle, a, a drawing of him, uh, Jasper Rose. Uh, Barbara um, has written a couple children's books that tell her family history. And I included here for many reasons and not least of which, you know, one of the things I did with my research was write a book. I, while I would love to think that maybe a, a young person would be interested in reading it. I mean, I'm not really kidding myself. That that wasn't really the audience that it would probably appeal to. So scholars like Barbara sharing her family history in creative ways to entice a younger audience um, to care about this history is absolutely invaluable. So I mentioned that I would return to Martha Penn Taylor. Um, she plays an exceptional role uh, throughout the 19th century. Um, uh, with each of the generations of Elijah, Indiana, and Daisy. And what you're seeing here is um, in 1854, Martha took the initiative, um, as you can tell as you read through this letter, Martha had been enslaved by, enslaved and then sold into a, a slave trader's hands, a Mr. Woodbrew. And Martha knew that she was about to, that uh, Mr. Woodruff was going to uh, sell her and sell her most likely into the further into the deep south, which would have separated her most likely forever from her sister that she references here, a sister named Mary. So she is writing, she is taking the really remarkable step to write directly to Elijah Fletcher, a white enslaver and say, would you please buy me so that I, I at least stay with my sister, Mary. So this is the first generation that Martha Penn Taylor, and then she was Martha Penn, um, uh, that she uh, is enslaved at Sweetbriar. And then over the decades, she then uh, helps uh, Indiana and then in some cases single-handedly raises Daisy while her mother is, her mother spends a lot of time in New York City. So the other thing I wanna mention in terms of techniques, there's obviously the, the careful study of wills and then historic documentation. But there's also important, the importance of studying the geography of slavery. And by that, I mean the connections among plantations. And this is everything from the connections, you know, plantations that are connected because they're trading resources with each other, because the white families have their own kinship connections. Um, and in this case, the quote down here from 1843 um, is obviously a very, this is Elijah writing this, and, and he, Elijah has a very romanticized and almost certainly an accurate perception of um, the African-American families and how much of a merry time that they're having. But what is accurate and important here is when he says that they all started from here this morning, meaning Sweetbriar, which is shown in the picture, to Tusculum Plantation for a quilting, um, and that they'll be back tomorrow. So Tusculum, as I mentioned in the beginning, this was the plantation that Elijah ended up inheriting through marriage that was, it's eight miles north of Sweetbriar. And it's not just that Elijah and Elijah's wife, Marie Antoinette, has family connected to Tusculum, it's that therefore the enslaved community also has family ties in both plantations. Um, and this is very important when you start to study things like the distribution of slave cemeteries and how Black families are trying to manage these forced separations between spaces. This gives you just kind of an overview of not just, so there's Sweetbriar, which is the red dot in the lower left-hand corner, the city of Amherst. And then if you look at the red dot just up at the top, that's where Tusculum was located. And then the third dot in the lower right-hand corner, that's Mount San Angelo. This is a postbellum, uh, this was built in the postbellum era. Uh, 
but it's still connected. I, I mentioned that Elijah actually had four children. Three of them in, inherit plantations or build plantations in and around Amherst. And that's his sister, Indi uh, his daughter, Indiana, one of his sons, uh, Sydney up at Tusculum, and then his other daughter, Elizabeth at Mount San Angelo. Um, and we can look at this in terms of the connections among the white children and their families, but it is as relevant to understand the connections among the black families that worked in these different sites. So for example, this is a, a photograph of Tusculum in 1905 in the bottom. And um, the, the woman sitting there that is Mary Banks and her son. And then she is taking care of um, the five children of the Williams family, um, not connected to the man that Indiana Fletcher Williams married, but a different Williams family that's connected uh, to the Crawford family. Um, and Mary Banks's family is connected to Amherst and um, the region. And then at the top, you see a different storyline that's connected to Tusculum. And this is Sidney Fletcher, one of Elijah's sons. Um, and what's important to, what can, what, only once you do a lot of research and also talk with families in Amherst, do you realize that on one hand, the census record, the fact that it's a white man who's farming and he has African-American, I mean, you can look through this and see he has people who are helping him um, as, as servants and farmhands. There's nothing unusual in that. But the real story here is that Sidney um, uh, had, a, was a, his common law wife was um, Harriet Edwards. And then his children were Lily, their children were Lily and Ernest, which comes out only after um, a very careful study of some later uh, lawsuits um, and court documents where neighbors are attesting to the relationship that was never, I mean, never clearly written down, but that was an open secret. Um, the way, you know, Thomas Jefferson and his uh, forced relationship with Sally Hemings was an open secret at the time. So lots of stories to recover. Um, and I hope that everyone, by the way, in the process of looking at this, uh, the historic building of Tusculum, as I mentioned, there are five, there's Mary Banks and her son, and then there are five children, um, white children, three of whom are sitting on fence posts, which is another important approach to studying historic photographs that you just never know what is going to be in the photograph. So one last mention um, before we look uh, to uh, some postbellum information, um, that one of the other impacts of slavery is that, uh, especially in the central Virginia and here in the Shenandoah Valley, in some cases, enslavers had more labor than they needed in any given moment or in any given season. And thus the practice of hiring out individuals was an added layer to the institution of slavery. So in this case, what's happening is uh, uh, Elijah Fletcher had hired out some of, his, of some of the African-American man enslaved at Sweetbar. Um, and this is someone writing to him, talking about what these individuals would be uh, working on. Um, and it's, it's another window into part of American history and how we constructed the very elaborate transportation system that was the canal system prior to the railroads. Um, again, a, 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 with a lot um, of contributions from African-American laborers. So returning to Daisy for a moment, um, as I mentioned, Daisy died young, but she was um, very precocious. Um, she kept a very detailed diary. And the names that are listed here in her various diaries, these are all of the African-American men and women and some children who were helping raise Daisy run the, the plantation. Um, Again, we only have photos for very, very few of them, but here is Martha, again, who was her uh, nursemaid and a housemaid. And then the man on the left is Logan, uh, who was uh, of Monacan descent and actually had, had many, many tasks, way more than what's listed here, not just a house and a farm manager. Um, but in addition, this is where working with descendants is so critically important. Um, these are individuals who are descended from uh, Martha Penn Taylor. Um, who returned to Sweetbar now about 10 years ago um, to, learn, to, to learn some of the resources that were in the Sweetbar archives and then to share some of their stories. So, you know, again, I can't overestimate, uh, 
oral histories are so critical to doing this research. And along the way, um, I had help from um, the Whitfields. Um, Carla at that point was the superintendent at Booker T. Washington site and her husband, John. And uh, here we are, we did a series of oral interviews. I, I mentioned a moment ago, maybe up to 20% of the staff was directly descended from these families. So we embarked in a series of interviews, trying to reconstruct stories that people might remember about any of these individuals. Um, and by the way, on the left-hand side is a much earlier photograph of individuals who were mostly dead by the time we did this oral interviews, but some of the people who were being referenced in these interviews. And this is where some of the stories came out of a Monacan man named Bowman Knuckles. And he is the individual in part because as you can see from this picture in the middle, um, he was very short. He worked as a gardener at Sweetbriar for decades. He was born in the 1890s. And I'm almost positive it's him in uh, that postcard, even though he's, he's not attributed anywhere. But from oral history, we learned that he spent decades and decades and decades constructing um, helping construct gardens, landscaping, um, and uh, was had very well known. So there are two other families I want to uh, talk about before we end uh, tonight. Um, again, there were over 150 people enslaved in the 1860s. That represents, as you saw from the will, uh, that represents about two dozen different fa separate families. But the two I wanted to talk about tonight, one, uh, it's descendants of Sterling Jones, um, who in turn, Sterling is descended from two individuals um, who were enslaved. And here is, here is Sterling, uh, who was born after, I mean, he was not born enslaved, um, him uh, with some of his children. Um, and the woman on the right, Dorothy Jones Sales, is one of his daughters. Um, she's in the picture on the left in the wagon. And Dorothy ended up working for Sweetbriar um, for many decades. She received an honorary degree from Sweetbriar. Um, and I uh, had the privilege of interviewing her just a few years before she died. And she had so much history. And she is standing in front of a cabin that was originally built to house enslaved families and then was used for many, many different purposes. Um, including the Alumni Association, the home for the Alumni Association. But here, by the time this photograph is taken in the um, early 20th century or the late, uh, gosh, it feels so long ago, but uh, in the late 20th century, <laughs> um, it, it had been, uh, well, first it was transformed into a farm tool museum. And then when I arrived at Sweetbriar along with uh, assistance from uh, student researchers, uh, we transformed it into a museum that shares some of the history of African or Native American families. Um, and in terms of the generational connections, so Sterling Jones, um, uh, he actually had many children um, and uh, three different wives, um, but this is Crystal Rawson and Sterling was her great grandfather. And Crystal is another historian and genealogist who has spent certainly more than a decade researching her family um, and uncovering just sometimes heartbreaking, but remarkable stories about her family over um, two and three centuries in and around Amherst. And on the right-hand side is um, Sterling's gravestone. He's buried nearby in Coolwell um, in a historic cemetery connected with an historic black church. And I include this, you know, it's actually somewhat unusual for me not to be talking about cemeteries pretty much all the time in a talk, um, but I include this as a reminder that um, researching African-American families, um, retelling these stories, that cemeteries can be a really great source of information on kinship ties, obviously birth dates and death dates, but also epitaphs and many other things about people's um, identities that are important to these stories. So the second family um, that I, I want to um, kind of end with uh, are the descendants of the Fletchers. Now, to be clear, this in this case, this is not a case, this is um, the white Fletchers, the African-American family that took the surname Fletcher. This is not because of a direct, you know, intermarriage with the white Fletchers. Um, Reverend Fletcher and his kin are descended from James and Lavinia Fletcher, um, who, uh, or Lavinia was certainly enslaved at Sweetbriar. Um, and then they had um, 
uh, their children, um, many of them remained in Amherst and the Reverend Fletcher is descended from one of those children. Um, and here he is standing, I mentioned in the beginning, there are two cemeteries, uh, uh, more than two cemeteries, but two main cemeteries at Sweet Bar. The, in the background is a cemetery for enslaved families. And it was the Reverend Fletcher back in 2001 when I first started this research, I, I knew there was a cemetery, I had come to find out there was a cemetery, a, a cemetery for enslaved families. I was starting to study that, but at that point, Sweet Bar hadn't been in touch with any descendants at all, at least not in many, many, many decades. And at the time, the, the, the then Dean of Student Affairs, who herself was from Nelson County, uh, Valerie Walker, she and I sat down and I was hoping that maybe she would know some folks because she was from Nelson County um, or nearby. And we very unscientifically opened up the phone book and started calling Fletcher's to see if we could find anyone who was descended. And the Reverend Fletcher very kindly answered, the, didn't hang up on us and turned out to have you know, a huge amount of family history and stories. And the Fletcher family um, has returned to Sweet Bar on several occasions during their family reunions to come and pay respects to the individuals buried in the cemetery um, and also to learn more about the lives of their family, their family members that were enslaved at Sweet Bar and then there are many descendants in uh, Amherst County. Uh, you'll remember a moment ago when I was talking about Barbara Rose Page, uh, if you were looking carefully, um, her family tree, the Roses um, and the Fletchers are all descendants from James and Lavinia. Um, and here you see on the left-hand side, um, some of the Fletcher descendants standing at the uh, Cemetery for Enslaved Families. Um, and then on the right-hand side, during one of the reunions, coming back to hold both a, a Christian service at the site and then also a libation ceremony to remember their ancestors. This, all of this work continues into the present. I myself, I mean, I left Sweet Bar a couple of years ago to pursue another opportunity, um, but Professor Waugh um, uh, in the history department, um, she and her students are continuing this research um, and as importantly, continuing the rec not just the recognition of this research through reading and writing and papers, but through rituals. Um, and here, for example, Founders Day, like many Southern schools, uh, Founders Day is held annually to recognize founders and Professor Waugh uh, is continuing to increase our understanding of all of our founders, you know, not just Elijah Fletcher, Indiana Fletcher or um, Daisy. I'll end with just a couple examples because I, encourage folks, um, you know, this history to, to make sure that it's relevant, it continues to be relevant, people are interested in it. Um, it it's not just going to be through books. Um, as much as some of us read books all the time, uh, it's going to have to be that kind of hands-on visceral learning in American history. Um, so some of the many projects that we did at Sweet Bar over the last two decades, on the left-hand side, um, we were honored by actually, the well, by Joseph McGill, who runs the Slave, Slave Dwelling Project. It was actually the first time he had been invited, this was many years ago, invited to a college or a university for what he continues to this day. Um, he sleeps overnight in slave cabins to raise awareness of their, of their existence and the existence of the histories of the families that lived in them and to preserve them, to make sure that our landscapes, especially our plantation landscapes are not just the old, the big houses, but that they're the whole story. Um, so he and Crystal is standing uh, next to him. Um, and then on the right-hand side, Dr. Lenny Sorensen, um, another Albemarle resident, um, I invited her years ago, some of her many different expertises uh, is in um, 19th century cooking. And so she, uh, along with it, the Buckingham Culinary School students um, ended up doing a demonstration of obviously open fire cooking um, uh, adjacent to the cabin. We did not do it in the cabin. I didn't want to burn it down. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we, we have to design programs that uh, um, attract young people so that they continue this research. Um, in Amherst County, certainly pre-COVID, um, once a year, all the fourth and fifth graders would have like kind of an enrichment day and we would bring them to uh, the college and uh, take them on tours of our landscape. Um, and I, more than once as I was, you know, telling some of these stories and 
you know, students would raise their hands and they would realize that I was talking about their great, great grandmother or grandfather. So this, this history is always continuing. So I did want to leave time for questions. So I will, you know, end uh, the slideshow there. Um, and what I will probably do is take down the slides because otherwise I can't see people. <laughs> So give me one moment to stop sharing. There we go. So I can also see the, the chat. Um, Sterling, do you want, are there things that I've already missed that I should answer? <laughs> well, first I would just like to say, thank you very much. That was a great presentation, uh, very interesting research. Um, <clears throat> don't have many uh, questions in yet, but uh, one from Ramona Chapman, you touched on this some already. Um, what records do you have of enslaved African Americans associated with the Monaco Nation of Amherst? Yes, so this is definitely ongoing research. Um, and for a moment, I'll go back to the idea of cemetery research. So many of the people, uh, certainly uh, names that I'm looking at right now are probably very familiar that the ancestral homeland of the Monaco Indian Nation is in Amherst, in and around Paul Mountain. And well, there are multiple cemeteries there, some of which are very private, but there's also a historic cemetery um, that is more publicly accessible. And that was where I started gathering names of individuals of Monacan descent, um, especially in the 19th century, and then comparing that with census records and pulling together people who, um, for example, were uh, either farm workers at the Sweetbriar Plantation, or employees of the college in the 20th century, um, or we also had tenant, tenant farmers. Uh, as I mentioned, there were up to 10,000 acres in the 19th century connected with Sweetbriar. So there's actually a lot of connections to Monacan families as laborers, as tenant farmers. Um, and several of, the, several of the families that were listed on that list of enslaved families in uh, 1858, several of them are of Monacan descent. Um, so there's not like a record of this, but, and I should also say that that's one of the areas where there's so much more research that can be done through oral histories with members of the Monacan Indian Nation um, and their family histories. Um, and this, so I see another question from Sam. Hi, Sam. Um, about if the enslaved graveyard has any individual like extant gravestones. So in the case of the cemetery at Sweetbar for enslaved families, yes, but unfortunately none of them are inscribed. So in other words, they don't have names or dates. Um, again, many people on this call will realize that um, one of the repercussions of the Nat Turner revolt in 1831 is that white enslavers were uh, you know, petrified that this would start happening again and again. And one of the ways they tried to control, decrease the chances is they passed laws that made it illegal for enslaved individuals to read and write. And, and they meted out punishments if um, white teachers or black teachers were taught trying to teach people. This does not mean that, I mean, many enslaved people still, of course, risked that, took those risks and taught themselves to write or learn from the Bible or other family members, but it meant that in terms of putting inscriptions on headstone, obviously if you, in, if your black family is burying your dead then during that time period and you inscribe your headstones, clearly someone knows how to read and write. So there was a bit of a risk involved in that. So of the slave cemeteries I've studied in central Virginia, the equivalent of thousands of separate graves and gravestones, maybe 5% of them are inscribed. So it, it does happen, but it's unusual. And in the case of Sweetbriar, none of them are inscribed, but there are stones. They're not, it's not marble, they're, they're not obelisk, they're um, locally available field stones. There are some quartz stones. Some of them are, are carved into oval shapes. Um, and then they're distributed. Some of them are head and foot stones and some of them are single stones. There's about 60 people buried in that cemetery. Great. And we have a question from Facebook from C. Davis. Do you have any tips on finding historic photos that has um, shows families with servants or the enslaved in them or any diary search tips? Well, diary search tips, I don't other than, I mean, in most cases, 
any extant diaries would be with family members. So if you yourself are descended, it would be asking elders, it would be looking in attics, but, and there are, there are of course some very rich, like UNC, um, their archives has a very rich collection of documents that document black and white Southern families, but diaries are a rarity. Um, in terms of photographs, you know, there's never any one spot. I mean, truly for this research at Sweet Bar, I, just, I mean, every single, every photograph, whether it was in a newspaper, whether, whether it was in an old Sweet Bar history, whether it was in a student scrapbook, like a white student scrapbook, I was just always, always looking for any face that didn't look white. So that it could, in other words, when I first started this, not, not just Bowman Knuckles, but um, unfortunately in many of these historic photographs, African-Americans are not necessarily, if, if it's, if the photograph is kept by family, then people tend to be identified. But, you know, if it's what the questioner just described, which is maybe it's like the white family posing in front of their house and then their African-American servants with them, it's just very rare that they made, the, the white family made the effort to include names. So it's just always collecting those photos and then always returning that to them anytime you think that you can, you've identified someone or you've found a descendant who maybe can recognize someone. But there, unfortunately, there's no one source of these historic photos. It, it's really just in everything you search, whether it's newspapers, letters, archives, always, always keeping your eyes open. Um, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment, just a lots of thank yous and wonderfuls and. Um, and I do want to point out, I mean, I, so again, I'm not at Sweet Bar anymore, but I, I uh, for any of you who have uh, children of college age, um, I know Professor was on um, the, not the Facebook, but the Zoom call with us. And again, she is leading the, this research. And so if any of you were fortunate enough to have um, children uh, who could study with her at Sweet Bar, you know, yes, I wrote a book, I spent a lot of time doing this research, but it, it's not the end of this research. There, there's so many more stories. There's so much work to do. Um, and fortunately, again, there are some other individuals. I don't think uh, Derek Nicholas is on the call, but that's another local historian and genealogist um, who has spent many, many years um, collecting his family history, but his fam this is how the power of genealogy. Um, as one individual, as he's collecting his family histories, let's just say if there were two Venn diagrams of his family histories and then the individual at Sweet Bar, there's a huge amount of overlap because these families, if, if you do it well and you do it like a real deep dive into these family histories, all the families start connecting in this just huge social network that's, again, critical to understanding American history. So I, I encourage everyone doing this research that you're always like one step away from having other colleagues, whether or not they're direct family members or not, but other individuals who are part of that story. <laughs> so the more you can, like, for example, how um, two of the people descended from James and Lavinia, um, women roughly my age, Dr. Annette Anderson and Bethany Pace, they can, I mean, they don't, they live, uh, you know, even then they didn't live in Virginia. They came across this research because I had created a website and they were searching for family history. So information is out there, but it's a question of knitting together people and these photographs and these um, stories. Um, so yeah, never give up. Um, and I'm just grateful for everyone's time, especially on a Friday night uh, in December. Um, and Tom and Sterling, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you. This has been great. Uh, very interesting and enlightening. I have one more question. Meek is Sweetbriar in this history, in the sense of starting as a plantation, becoming a college, and then still continuing to have the descendants of those original laborers you know, working at that even up through the 20th century. And I'm sorry, the first part of the question was like how unique, how unique, um, how unique is this experience? Well, so I haven't, I mean, now I'm at Washington Lee where I'm doing the same sort of research 
uh, but I don't have you know 20 other examples um, directly. But I would say in rural, um, what is not unique is that in various, especially more, more often rural areas, but not exclusively, um, the permanency, not the permanency, but the stability of black and white families, generation after generation, it's, it's more common in rural areas than urban areas. So, um, you know, I can't imagine this is completely unique because other historic, the, the unique part is most likely the twist about that it was a, that it was a plantation first and then a college in the exact same spot. But with other, some other Southern schools where there were large plantations in the area, um, but then some of those individuals and their descendants end up working at what later becomes a college at that. I mean, technically UVA <coughs> itself, you know, originally the, 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 and now I'm going to get some of this wrong off the top of my head, but what's his today Brown's college that was originally, you know, a, a smaller plantation. Um, I can imagine people who were enslaved there and then all the robust research that's going into the people who then were enslaved by faculty, trustees, and students at UVA, you know, those black families don't just disappear. They're still there. So in that sense, I wouldn't think it's as unique that, Black families in, in many of our communities for generations have been building those communities, even under the, uh, the horrors of slavery and then into the present. But the direct plantation to college, that, that is much, much rarer. I think, yeah, you touch on kind of like the, the hidden history there that wasn't incorporated into the larger narrative you know, the sense of Jefferson founded, you know, UVA or the founding of a college, but the sense of what went into it um, and the stories that are there. I mean, I think maybe what's unique is maybe your research at Sweetbriar to uncover that. Um, maybe some of the earliest um, in terms of looking at a, a university and its, its, you know, connection directly to an enslaved community that is now part of its labor force? Well, I, I don't think it's the earliest, but it was, but I started this work in 2001 at, uh, around the time that like Brown was starting to address its connection, Brown University, its connection to um, and reliance on enslaved labor. So I would say it's, it's roughly all around that time when several of us, mostly, in, I mean, I know it's impossible for us to imagine now, but in those days, I mean, I didn't know what was happening. We, we didn't have any of the social media. So we were you know, I think it was more like a moment in time where multiple people were working across the country to recover these stories. Um, and then now, for example, 10 years ago with the founding of a group that's um, University Studying Slavery, which have, has over 60, which is based out of UVA, over 60 different colleges and universities committed to doing this work. Now, thank heavens, it's hopefully it's, it's now standard practice that when you study history, especially 19th century history, um, you're looking at, and it depends on the region in the, in the, in the country, we would be dealing with all sorts of other groups, but here, especially in Amherst County, it's African-American, Native American, European American history. Those three groups, you, you can't understand Amherst history. It, you always have to be studying those three groups to understand the story. Well, this has been great. Um, I appreciate you, uh, like you said, coming out on a Friday evening to, uh, uh, to tell us about the, the amazing research and work that you've done. And I think it definitely is a, an example and a model for uh, many people to look at and follow and, and, and or just to think outside the, the box of, you know, what, what they learned in school, so to speak, and that there's so much more out there to uncover. And that connection that you said to the youth in terms of you know, people realizing, well, you're talking about my family now. And, you know, how those, how those narratives, how those conversations, how those oral histories need to be, you know, brought together as a whole into one, one story, one history. Right. Yep. Very important. Well, we're hitting a little bit beyond six o'clock here on a Friday evening. So, uh, I know I'm a little bit hungry. I need to grab some dinner and, uh, um, had my booster shot yesterday, so I'm feeling a little out of it, but uh, 
hope everyone else out there enjoyed this. I did. And uh, if you have any additional questions or uh, comments, please feel free to email us and we can pass them on to Lynn. Um, I saw a number of things in Facebook and, and Zoom asking if this was recorded and it's available on our Facebook page. And also we'll uh, download it and uh, get to upload it to our YouTube site next week. So uh, you can share it as far and wide with people who weren't able to see it. Um, again, uh, let me find my notes here. Our speaker series is brought to you by the Arbor Moe Charlottesville Historical Society and wonderful supporters like you. Um, our end of year appeal letter is out there in our chat. So uh, I see uh, Mr. Martin is very interested in maybe looking in his wallet and seeing if there's any uh, money in, uh, for the Historical Society mixed in in there with his own. So uh, if he wants to pull that money out and give it to him, us, we will definitely be able to use it to help with these programs and all so much more that we're trying to do in 2022. Um, thanks again for Dr. Rainsville for joining us today. Thanks to everyone out there for joining and supporting what we do. And I am Tom Chapman here with Sterling Howe, and we hope to see you for our next program with Gail Jessup in the new year. Till then, stay safe and support local history. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.